Hi friends, my name is Al, a little star nerd. What's up? Remember a while ago, I was like, oh, guys, I'm talking weird, I got Invisalign. I was actually lying. <laughs> I was in a retainer, I was in a temporary retainer. I now have actual Invisalign, and so I once again sound weird, I'm lisping. Um, sorry, <laughs> nothing I can do about it. This is what I sound like now. Anyways, today we are working in my sketchbook again. I've been really trying to enjoy it as much as I can. But today we're doing something extra fun. We're doing another Pinterest board character design challenge. If you don't know, what that means is I ask you guys to create a Pinterest board of like 10 to 15 pins, kind of describing some sort of character. And then I create a character based off of that Pinterest board. I've done a few of these. I think I'm gonna make a playlist with them. Uh, they're really fun. I really enjoy them. Check out the other videos. This time I specifically asked for apocalypse or post-apocalypse characters. Everyone loves an apocalypse story. Every artist has an apocalypse or post-apocalypse OC knocking around in their head. And there's been such a resurgence of this genre with like The Last of Us, and it's just an iconic trope. But I do feel like a lot of the landscapes that we tend to see are kind of the same. We've got the same vibe going on, the same aesthetics going on. You know, I can picture like the most basic Pinterest board, you know, with the green army jacket and combat boots and a gun and a, ba a bloody bandage wrapped around a hand. Like we all know that specific vibe. I thought it would be fun to, with your help, <laughs> We'll talk about that, but with your help, come up with some apocalypse or post-apocalypse characters that are like different than what you would normally expect. That is obviously one of my weak spots is why I do this challenge in general is to practice coming up with characters, but also coming up with original concepts. I'm not good at that. I'm not good at coming up with characters, original concepts and being creative. It's just, it's a weak point for me. You might disagree, but like I struggle with that. And that's where you all come in. That's why we're, we're doing this is that you guys can kind of do a little bit of the beginning lifting for me. like gathering some inspo and so I don't have to get super freaked out in my head about it and I can look at that and create something from there. You guys consistently just kill it every single time I ask for these boards. This time I was blown away. You guys came up with some genius ideas that I never would have been able to come up with on my own. So thank you so much if you submitted a board. I'm sorry if I didn't pick yours. I'm really, really excited. I was really excited about a lot of them. There were some really, really good ones, but I'm definitely excited about the ones that they did pick, but it was tough to pick them. There were a lot of really good ones. But yeah, thank you so much for helping me out because you you really don't, it really is a help. Like you have no idea. It's a major help for me. If you would like for me to draw your board, I'm gonna tell you how that can happen. One, I'm gonna say right now, please don't DM me any. Last time I did this video, I got a bunch of like DMs of pins. Um, I have a Google form and on that Google form, there are a lot more thorough instructions on kind of what I'm looking for, do's and don'ts. Please make sure you read those. I get a lot of boards that don't, I don't think they've read those descriptions and I automatically like can't use those boards because those, all those requests are there for a reason. So please make sure you read that. Also, it's not open all the time. I only open it when I'm specifically asking for characters. I will either ask for like a generic, just any board you can think of, or I will ask for like a themed board. Like this time I asked for post-apocalyptic or apocalypse, whatever. And so when I open <laughs> that Google form, for submissions, I will post about it on my community page and my Instagram. So if you want to be in the next video, if you want your board drawn by me, follow me, obviously subscribe to me or follow me on Instagram and keep an eye out over there for when I announce it being open. It's always really fun when you guys do participate. I love looking at the boards. It's so, so fun. So if you do want to submit a board, just keep an eye out. I will definitely be asking for more because I love doing these videos. Oh, I also need to thank my patrons. Your names are on screen. Thank you so much for being a patron. I finally have the rewards in person to show you. It's very late in the month, but you still have time to get these. This is the postcard and this is the sticker. It's a little fox. They're really cute. I'm really in love with them. I also have uh, early access to art, monthly podcasts, monthly exclusive video, all sorts of stuff. So go check that out. Thank you for your support. If you are checking me out, if you're already supporting me, whatever, thank you. And finally, before we actually get into the video, let me talk to you about today's sponsor, Skillshare. I know that you guys know about Skillshare. Who doesn't? Skillshare is amazing. We love Skillshare. It is the largest online learning community for creatives with thousands of classes. These classes are led by industry pros covering topics from photography, illustration, fine art, marketing, productivity, and so much more. Skillshare is a great way to invest in yourself, your creative growth, your goals by starting a learning journey for your passion, your hobby, your side hustle, whatever it may be. There are a lot of classes on Skillshare. If you're a little overwhelmed and you don't know where to start or exactly what skill you would like to learn or further, Skillshare has learning paths that are gonna send you in the right direction. Learning paths are a collection of classes that are kind of meant to be taken in that order. They kind of build off of each other and reinforce previous lessons. And of course, there is a wide variety of categories. So if you're looking for something in productivity or design or marketing, I am really interested in this learning path, creative productivity, kickstart and sustain any project. 
It's comprised of six classes made by different teachers and they all focus on teaching creatives and freelancers how to create and start projects and actually follow through on finishing them. That is a big thing that I'm working on this year. It's one of my biggest goals is I have multiple projects that I really, really want to work on for myself. And I think this learning path is really going to help. If you also would like to kind of invest in yourself and your creativity, make sure you check out Skillshare. The link is down below. The first 500 people to use my link will get a one free month trial to Skillshare. So make sure you check that out. Thank you so much to Skillshare for sponsoring. Now let's get into this Pinterest challenge. We're starting off strong with one of the most unique boards I think I've ever gotten. This one comes from Katie Bear Zero. The second I saw it, I, I was like, you know, this is genius. I need to do this one. It's a very interesting and somewhat eclectic board of early 2000s to 2010s stuff, like silly bands. For me, when I saw that major draw to this board, if you know me, you know, I still have a love for these shits. I'm wearing one literally right now. <laughs> anyway, so we've got the silly bands. We've got Avril Lavigne, a Justice catalog, groups of girls, Chuck E. Cheese, Empty Mall, some robotic creatures that are very menacing looking, a very wide assortment of stuff to work with, nothing particularly obvious, except for like, you know, the era, lots of world building here. It felt like a really strong concept. For this character, I'm definitely seeing it as post-apocalypse, and honestly, I don't have the how and why <laughs> of the world ending really fleshed out. I see the story being pretty self-contained to one area. And so the state of the world wasn't super relevant when I was thinking it through. So this is a young girl, maybe eight to 10 years old. Her parents take her to this Chuck E. Cheese in the mall one day. She's crawling around in those nasty ass tubes, playing with the other kids. And then all of a sudden they, the kids start hearing like screaming and chaos and banging and they all freeze like panic. You know, those little like windows where you can look out from the, the play tubes, maybe some of the kids peek out and they're like, oh, oh boy, <laughs> you know, our parents are being torn apart. It doesn't look good. You know, by whatever is the source of the world ending in this particular story, I, I'm probably by like some sort of, I'm thinking like militant robots or something. I don't know where they came from or why they took over, but they did. Um, I guess the parents wouldn't be torn apart either. They're probably like detained, taken away. Um, <laughs> but definitely in a violent way that makes it like very clear to these kids that they need to stay hidden and that their entire world as they know it is ending, right? Like something very obvious that society is over, even for these like little six year olds to understand. However, I also don't want them dealing with any bodies left behind. So something along those lines. But basically all the kids that are stuck in these tubes are the only survivors in pretty much the entire mall. Maybe there are a few other stragglers that were able to hide and survive, but mostly the only people left in this entire mall slash town slash country slash maybe world, however far this extends, um, are these like two dozen kids that were hiding in these Chuck E. Cheese tubes. And then 10 years pass and our girl is now 18 to 20 years old and that is where her story takes place. She's definitely one of the older kids from that day and there probably are, you know, there are some adults still here. Um, like I said, some other people might've survived, but of the kids, of our main characters, our main cast, she's one of the oldest. So she's definitely taken on a kind of leadership role. They all live in this rundown empty mall. They've got all the exits secured so they can safely traipse around and no threats can enter. And they're fully self-sufficient. You know, they've got kitchens, and food supply, we'll say it's one of those malls with like a Walmart attached. So they've got a good food supply of food available to them. They've got entertainment and clothing. You know, they've got a conveniently still running power source of some sort. I always used to wonder how that worked, but then the Zombieland movies actually made a really good explanation of like their power grid is run by like a dam. So as long as like the dam is full, we have power. And I thought that was, wow, what a great explanation. So we'll go with that. These kids definitely build their own little society within this mall. I don't think they would go feral or anything and the older kids would take on kind of responsibility and taking care of the younger kids and raising them type of thing. They go on missions outside of the mall to provide for everyone. Um, I'm assuming, you know, their food supply, while plentiful, there's not that many of them. They would probably want to go get like fresh meat or whatever, right? Things like that. You know, they, they really have like a, a full community going on. And the culture of this community, full on 2000s core, baby. We love to see it. Remember when you were in elementary school and you would look up at the middle schoolers and the high schoolers and you were like, holy shit, one day I'm gonna be as cool as them, just you wait. And when you're stuck in a world where culture ends at a very specific point for kids, 
I don't think they'd really move on from that to create like a completely new one, especially when they're stuck in a mall, which is basically a time capsule of that zeitgeist. Like they are constantly surrounded by reminders of that era. As they grow up, culture isn't progressing beyond that time, so their only reference for what a teen or adult is supposed to be like or dress like or look like is what they remember from when they were kids and looking up at those older people, or what they're seeing on the covers of the magazines in the small. So by the time our character is becoming a teen, a young adult, they've hit this point where their own culture is this weird mishmash of the things they held dear as children, the things that got them through, their world literally ending, their favorite toys in the small, the clothes they wore at that time, and also the pop culture from back then. So for our culture, who I think as a kid was very, very girly, into princesses and Barbies and pink, her style is now this strange mix of grunge that her idols wore, like Avril Lavigne, and hyper-feminine stuff like Hello Kitty and Justice clothing, stuff she thought was really fun and cool as a little kid. So her design is mostly based around that. She's got her hair up in those adorable little bobble hair ties that used to be very, very popular when I was a kid. I've always loved those. She's got a Justice shirt on that's a bit cropped on her because you know, it's, it's made for little kids. She's torn the sleeves off so maybe it'll fit her a little better. Camo cargo pants for practicality purposes. And also it's very much that 2010s fashion influence. She's got Heelys on, which were literally like the coolest things for a while. Like you saw them everywhere. And these kids would absolutely be wearing them now. I think they're also practical just for like getting around a giant mall anyways. So I think they, they work on multiple levels here. She's got a chain on her belt loop, which helps her carry around her staple items, a Webkin's dog, her Tamagotchi, a rubber duck. She has her favorite Hello Kitty backpack on. Of course, she can't wear it with both straps on her shoulder because back in my day, at least, that was like the dorkiest thing. Like you could not, I felt so embarrassed. Obviously in, in elementary school, I would do it, but in middle school, I wouldn't be caught dead with both straps on my shoulders. I think that idea would definitely persist with these kids, but also, you know, we have to think practically here. That wouldn't function well in a situation in which they might have to like run for their lives. So she's wearing one of the straps across her body. So she's still staying in the lines of cool, but it's not like flopping all over the place. She's also got a temporary tattoo on her shoulder, some jewelry from Claire's. I think there would be a lot of this. You know, they have literally an entire mall of this stuff at their fingertips. You know, they'd be painting their nails and doing their hair and wearing all sorts of silly accessories and stuff in their free time. They've got nothing else to do, but go shop. You'll also notice that most of her clothes are pretty clean. They're not stained with blood or mud or anything from frequent wear, except for her like Heelys and her backpack, which she doesn't switch out that often. And that's because like she, she lives in a mall. She's got a giant wardrobe at her fingertips. So if anything ever gets stained or doesn't fit, she just picks something new. And then of course there's the silly bands. I think this is the most fun part of the board and the design. At the height of their popularity, silly bands were a status symbol for kids. They were literally currency. I spent hours like just trading with kids during school. I love the idea of that continuing in some way in this world. Obviously money would mean nothing to these kids, both because they're, they were kids and also it's an apocalypse. But to replace it, I think, I think silly bands are definitely like a trading token of some sort and also a symbol of status or hierarchy. This character has some sort of leadership role. She's got a lot of respect, she's older. So she's absolutely decked out in silly bands to symbolize that. I have a lot more of like her daily life and world and personality flesh out in my head. I really, really like this character, but I've already talked about her for long enough and we have three more characters to get to. She's definitely my favorite design of today. I think she turned out so fun and so cool. I love all the details she's got going on, but that's all I'll say for now. We'll get to the other characters. Our second board comes from Riv. Thank you so much, Riv. This board has a very small, limited color palette and to me, a very clear story. I saw this and immediately saw two things, religious cult and aliens. And that right there is already just like an amazing story all on its own. This character is not really fleshed out as a person, as an individual. Like the board, we're mainly focusing on the world and story at large and less about the individual character. 
So the character you're seeing here is more of a representation of what most people, or not most people, but what some people in this world look like, rather than being an actual individual with a story. But we're, we're gonna kind of retrofit a personality for them. <laughs> uh, just kind of add on to the concept here. So in this world, giant godlike aliens have taken the hell over. In this drawing, I have the character standing in the palm of the alien's hand, but I would like to say that I don't like the way I represented the hand slash the alien. I made its hand a literal human hand and it's not quite as big as I wanted it to be. So just imagine it a bit more alien-like and much more massive, okay? So anyways, one day these giant creatures come to earth from somewhere in space. They're huge, so big that you can hardly even see their heads and shoulders because they're disappearing into the atmosphere or the clouds. They're so big, they're almost beyond our comprehension and we are immediately at their mercy. We don't stand a chance against them. We're not prepared to fight them. No one saw them coming, except some people did. Before these aliens arrived, there was a cult gaining rapid popularity and spreading literally throughout the whole world. Maybe it started somewhere in LA. I feel like it would be like kind of a TikTok or influencer internet trend. And it really quickly like started taking over online, spreading like wildfire. And of course there are a bunch of people who are like, that's insane. Like these people are insane. They're throwing their lives away. They're crazy doomsday preppers. This cult is like growing and growing, becoming more and more extreme. And they're like really heavily worshiped. Like I think it would start out as some sort of wellness thing or kind of a meme type thing, but it becomes more and more extreme. You know, they're starting to really heavily worship these aliens that are supposed to be coming at some time soon. It's kind of nebulous. And it's pretty quickly becoming a literal organized religion. And there are these high priestesses and priests that are in direct communication with these new gods. And they tell these cult followers what to do and how to survive when the gods come back to earth. And they're trying to like warn the world and recruit like as many people as possible. But obviously the rest of the world is like, these people have issues and are they're having delusions and hallucinations and I will not be taking their advice because why would they? It's crazy. But then these alien creatures do show up and guess who is surviving? Of course, it's the members of the cult. The religion is now real. It's like it's a real religion. The gods are here and society is forever, forever changed. They take a step and wipe out entire cities. They're wreaking havoc on the earth and the humans who survived are starting to look at each other like, hey guys, like what are, what are we supposed to do here? What's going on? You know, these gods aren't super nice to us. They're literally destroying our home and don't seem to understand what a human needs to survive. They've been kind of left with raised cities and nowhere to go. And these gods or aliens or whatever can kind of sense the dissension going on and know that these humans have got to be whipped into shape. The people that were in direct contact with the gods resume their roles as high priests and priestesses and create these like outfits that the gods bless and they're like officially the link between humans and gods and have the special authority. They're in charge of their own little group of humans and housing them, taking care of them. They start, I don't know what, I don't know religious terms, some sort of nunnery kind of thing where they have their own little house, like religious household, a large, you know, compact type of thing commune type of thing <laughs> in different areas across the world. They would also be in charge of executing followers when certain people like speak out or express dissatisfaction with the gods. Most of these high priests are thrilled to do the work. They find it rewarding. They're praised so highly by the gods. They love it. You know, they're special, they're seen, they're powerful. But there are some who are like, oh my God, I don't want to kill people. They're watching Earth turn into a burnt, crispy shell of itself. Earth is starting to look a little bit like Mars. It's this red husk. They feel this quiet, ever-present and ever-hidden rage inside these giant aliens. And they know no matter how loyal and devout they are, this doesn't end well for any human. And one of those priests is our character. I purposely designed them to be very androgynous. I think any sense of identity or uniqueness or self or presentation is taken away by these aliens pretty quickly and they're all just humans. Like no names, no individuality, no pronouns, just like humans, obviously they have pronouns, <laughs> but as in like they're all they's, just, they're just humans versus priests versus gods. Like those are the three categories of beings. So they're very plain, very androgynous, no major identifying features, except for their bright flowing blue green eyes, which are a gift from the gods as one of the chosen few who can directly communicate with them. They're very emaciated and gray and colorless as these humans literally live in a foggy, colorless world because of the effect of these aliens on the planet. 
I think, you know, their life force has been drained from them. These, all of these humans are basically subsisting off of like literal scraps and the god, like gods may be pumping life force into them somehow. Like they are living on the bare minimum. They're hardly surviving. So our character is starting to get nervous because they know these aliens can like read their mind, like they're omniscient and they're trying to totally save face and pretend that everything's normal and everything's fine and nothing's changed. You know, they're still fully devout and they, they're happy to be here while also trying to protect the humans under their care who they're supposed to be executing and like trying to figure out how to get rid of or escape these literal omniscient beings. Overall, it ended up being a pretty plain design um, I think it reflects, not that the board itself is plain, but as in there's really only like two colors in this board. And so I, I had a limited color palette to work with. So I think it does kind of reflect it well. I'm happy with it. I think it's hitting all the things that I wanted it to hit. It's a little strange and disjointed and void of life. Um, there's some astral inspiration because we've got, you know, some space and alien influence. There's some religious motifs. So overall, I think it's doing the things that it needs to do. However, there's something about it that is just not quite hitting home for me. Next up, we've got another stunning board made by Andre. Thank you so much, Andre. Love this board. This board was so striking. Some gorgeous photos with a very intriguing vibe. Very, very interesting and eye-catching. I adore this motif of facelessness or lack of identity. And I felt a strong metropolitan or urban aesthetic. This is another character in which I really don't have a personality or story or motivation or individualism for this actual character but rather he's a representation of this society as a whole. So this is yet again a post-apocalyptic world where like 50, maybe maybe like, I don't know, a couple hundred, I don't know. I'm bad at the concept of time. We're a decent amount of time past the collapse of society. The world ending was brought on by multiple things, you know, climate change becoming too extreme, the atmosphere being unable to support any sort of life form on Earth, capitalism driving humanity into the ground, overpopulation, and increased reliance on technology, all sorts of stuff. And this is the world that was created mainly by already privileged and wealthy people who were able to prepare pre, you know, beforehand, they knew it was coming. This is what they've been able to build from that rubble. There is a very clear divide in this society of people who managed to stay rich and privileged during and after the collapse and people who are in no way doing well. <laughs> Rich people have entire buildings and domed areas that are miles wide that have safe environments that allow them to travel without needing to cover their bodies and skin or wear oxygen tanks. They wear intricate clothing and live lives of ultimate leisure. It's a very digital and technologically advanced world with digitally customizable clothing, hollow everything, and automated workforces. So it's literally the easiest life ever for these super rich people. But for those who aren't so lucky, life is weird and kind of hard and kind of pointless. The air is literally toxic, so people have to pay monthly stipends to whatever big corp has inevitably taken over to cover their housing and entertainment costs, quote unquote entertainment costs, as well as their subscription to breathable air, drinkable water, and digestible food supplements. Their skin can be exposed to the air, so they usually wear some sort of skin tight bodysuit with clear eye coverings to protect themselves. Fashion choices are very limited, but the things that are quote unquote on trend, i.e. the only things available to them, are geometric, impractical, sleek, and the remnants of what was once considered street fashion. Outerwear is usually designed to accommodate life packs, so they're oxygen, water, and feeding tanks. For this character, it's attached directly to his vest. His body isn't really a natural human body anymore. I think there would be some people who are still like kind of raw humans and probably the more money you are able to have is the more technologically advanced your body would become. There would be like the base amount that every human has. So like he has things in his body that attach to Wi-Fi and automate healthcare and stuff like that. He also has a permanent tracheostomy for him to breathe without a face mask as that became super unpopular a few decades ago. Now it's really important to keep devices and things off the face because now digi faceplates are all the rage. 
Digi face plates, of course, being these holographs that connect to a head covering, and they're literally customizable faces that blend somewhat seamlessly into your, into your head and allow you to feel the semblance of human connection once again. So in this drawing, he's flipping through his face options to decide what he wants to look like. People live in tiny box units in incredibly tall skyscrapers and dream of one day being able to see some sort of green vegetation inside the protective domes of the rich society. Their lives are filled with mindless commuting to nowhere, muffled meaningless conversations, and emptiness. They don't really have jobs or families, and they're, and they're packed into buildings like sardines. Maybe somewhere deep underground there's a group of people that have found a patch of earth that isn't actively hostile to humans, and they rediscover what it means to be human when they can take off all of this stuff that they're wearing, and they begin plotting a way to restore that hope to everyone else. Overall, I really like this design, and I think it is a really cool world. I don't think that I, you know, there's probably a story there, but none that I really connect with. I think the structure of the society is what is really interesting to me. I really loved my concept sketch for it. I think I couldn't really replicate the sketch the way I wanted to. The first one had this really fun, loose shape to it, and that's always really hard to replicate when you're trying to make it more realistic and you're worried about it more. I also think the color palette kind of killed the vibe somewhat, and I definitely think the head covering is the wrong color. I still think he looks like a pretty cool dude, uh, but yeah, the color palette is just not it. I think what I wanted to do was something very monochrome, very black, gray, dull, sad, lifeless, but that just wouldn't be interesting in the spread. And so I was trying to do something that still felt lifeless, but was more interesting. And I just, I don't think these colors ended up looking that good together, but I still really like the concept of it all. I like the jacket. I think he's a cool looking guy, like I said. Finally, our last board was created by Ayla. I loved the vibe going on here. We've got some vintage women, some gas masks, some planes, some deserts, and I believe some Saudi Arabian fashion. That is a somewhat educated guess based on Pinterest suggesting some related searches, one being Saudi Arabian woman. So I kind of ran with that. I did some Googling and that's what I was basing it on. I don't know if the woman pictured here is actually Arabian. I was just guessing. Here is a story that does actively take place in an ongoing apocalypse. You know, society hasn't had a chance to recover or rebuild itself at all. 
I really like the aviator vibes we've got going on and that's immediately where my mind started running to. This is a woman who is a pilot of her own private plane, queen, and maybe she was going out on a joyride or doing some sort of, I don't know, something. I don't know what people with private planes do, but she had one, she was, she was out in it, right? <laughs> when the power grid goes all the way down, in comes a horrible sandstorm. Simultaneously, there's like hundreds of devastating natural disasters going on all around the world to degrees which we've never seen before. She loses communication with anyone and she does a full Amelia Earhart. Her navigation systems fail and in the sandstorm, she gets lost and goes down. When she comes to, she finds herself on the outskirts of a half buried town, half buried in sand, that obviously did not survive the sandstorm. Her plane is severely damaged, but miraculously, she's mostly unharmed. She begins her years-long journey of trying to survive in this desert as raiders and looters and survivors come sniffing around the home she's built for herself. I think her story would start off at the plane crash and start really, really early on. That's why I say it's during the apocalypse. She survives off scraps that she finds in the nearby towns and cities and goes out hunting daily for metal scraps and tools she can use to repair her plane. Her only goal, the only thing she has keeping her going, is the hope that she can finally fix it and fly out of here and find somewhere that might be safer. I also think in the beginning, she wouldn't really know what happened. Like she's by herself and her communications go down. And as far as she knows, like it was just this one freak accident where she was. She has no idea that society as a whole has collapsed until maybe she starts running into these dangerous looters and, and gangs of people. Her design was really, really fun, but difficult to figure out. I had multiple really great, but very different sources of inspiration to go off of. You know, there's this general vintage tactical look, traditional Arabian clothing, and also the old fashioned aviator aesthetic. Combining all of those was really fun. And I think it worked really well together somehow. Like it all kind of vibe. She lives in a place that frequently experiences sandstorms, so her pilot gear has become a daily necessity. Her hat and goggles keep her ears and eyes protected, and paired with the head covering she wears, it keeps the wind from tangling up her hair or having it constantly getting in her eyes. I don't know what it's called, I don't think it's specifically an Arabian article of clothing, um, but she also has a detachable piece of cloth that covers the bottom half of her face as well. This keeps her face protected from the sand, but also the sun. I try to keep the bridge of her nose under her eyes and like tops of her cheeks a bit redder than the rest of her face, as if it's sunburned or see sees the sun often. She also wears her flying gloves, aviator gloves, and a long duster jacket. This jacket keeps her warm during cold evenings and nights, as well as protects her clothes from the wind and sand. When drawing, I tried to kind of make her clothing look dusty with the colored pencils. I don't think that, like, you know, covered in sand, I don't think that translated, but I do like that idea. Underneath the duster, she wears a traditional Arabian dress. While this character is Arabian, um, these clothes aren't necessarily hers, but likely found in the town she crashed near. She's also adorned other parts of her clothes, like the bottom of her duster, with more traditional accessories and accents in her free time when she has literally nothing else to do, but DIYs. I think this design is really fun and interesting. I love the mishmash of inspiration sources. I think that was a really, really fun aspect to this specific character. It created a challenge that I don't, I mean, I don't think I've ever done anything like that before. It was very fun. I think it ended up all just coming together really, really well, and that's super satisfying. Her story isn't particularly unique, or even, I, I don't know if I find her the most interesting story either. In fact, I, I think the story is very similar to that of Rey from the new Star Wars movies. If I'm remembering her story correctly, I don't know. I didn't watch those, I didn't love those movies, so I don't know. But <laughs> that's what I remember is like, she has to like, she's hunting in a sandstorm, right? In the beginning. Either way, I think it's a fun one and could be, a, it could be an interesting story. Uh, like I could see it being like a fun book. <laughs> could be some cool visuals. Um, I don't know if it's something that I would pursue. I think she's one of the more boring, less fleshed out characters today, is what I'm trying to say. I think her saving grace is that her outfit has a bit more going on and it has more details. I think that somewhat balances her out. I definitely like how she turned out and I'm really intrigued by her design. Um, she doesn't excite me as much as the others. But I love, one thing that I'm really loving about designing characters is thinking about you know, the things that they would need on a daily basis and, and putting in more and more of those details. And I think she has more of that thought about like, I, I like the functionality and the thought that goes into, well, this is why she wears this and this is why she wears this. I think it makes her feel more believable and better designed, but maybe that's just because I'm not good at this yet. I don't know.
Yeah, slay, success. I love it. I definitely think there are some better and weaker designs here. I think we all know which one is my favorite. Um, yeah, this one was really, really, really fun. I had such a great time. I love, I, one thing I love about these videos is I love every step of it. I love looking at the Pinterest boards. I love picking them out. I love letting the ideas come to me. I love doing the concept sketches. I love doing the final sketches. I love coloring them. Like I love every single step of this process. Do I always love the result? No, not every time. I feel like these two are pretty weak. Um, not, which is a shame because I do really like the concept sketch of this. I think I just don't I think I flopped on the color palette. I think the color palette is not delivering. I also think the proportions are wrong because the sketch is so, like the concept doodle sketch is so satisfying to me. This one does not have that same yumminess. But yeah, I think these are so fun, so slay. I had so much fun. She's just so iconic. I love, one thing I love, and I, I do blame this on prickly alpaca. I love a really busy character design. I love just like layers and layers of details and I don't know, like knickknacks and un, like just so much stuff on one character. Watching her character designs, she will add like a thousand little details. And it's just so like, you can't replicate, you can't draw that more than once, but I'm like, that just looks so good. That looks so good. And so I definitely think that like, busier characters are just more satisfying to me. And I, I just love how much stuff she's got going on, you know? If anyone has any name ideas for her, let me know. Cause I'm very attached to her. She's also cool. I think she's fun and funky and fresh. Um, and I like the concept for both of these. I'm just not, no one calls to me quite like she does. Anyways, that's it. Let me know which one's your favorite. If you like this process, um, let me, give me, you know what? Give me some ideas for the next theme. Like this theme was apocalypse. What should the next theme be? Cause I'm really enjoying doing it as a theme because I like seeing like the variety, like the diversity of characters I can get out of one concept. You know what I mean? Um, so I'm enjoying doing it with a theme. So let me know if you have any theme ideas. That's it. We did some art. We had a great time. I had a great time. I hope you did too. So we're going to call it there. Thank you so much for watching. If you did like it, like the video, comment, subscribe. I'm not saying it the way I normally do, so I don't know what to say. Do all that stuff. Thank you so much to Skillshare for sponsoring. Thank you for watching. Bye. <laughs> See you later. See you next time.